am telling you about a very special lady, one that I have come to know and appreciate deeply. Her name is Dr. Lucine Garapetian. She is a doctoral level board certified behavior analyst. Yes, her professional experience spans a variety of clinical settings and populations and age ranges on the spectrum from mild to severe challenging behaviors and skill levels. Yes, Dr. Lucine Garapetian uh, has expertise in intensive behavioral intervention, functional behavior uh, assessment, functional behavior assessment, and severe challenging behavior. Additionally, she is well-trained in organizational behavior, taking her training from the individual to the organization that works with this individual. She is passionate passionate about the dissemination of behavior analysis and her research interests. She is consistent throughout all that she does. Her research interest includes instructional effectiveness because she wants the people who work with persons uh, on the autism spectrum to be well-trained not to just try to figure it out as they go, but to know and understand what is really happening with persons who are on the spectrum, who are ought to be on the spectrum. So instructional effectiveness is important to her. Choice making, organizational behavior management, as I spoke of before, and exploring diversity related factors in applied behavioral analysis. Now it is important to know that she is not just passionate about all of this, but she herself is well-trained, well-trained instructional uh, effectiveness, effectiveness comes from within her. And she is currently on the board of directors for the California Association for Behavior Analysis. And she serves as an assistant professor and associate program director of the Master of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis program right here at the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University. She has a passion for these things and she's walking out her passion, empowering others to be effective and efficient as they work with this most special population. I'm delighted to hear from Dr. Garapetian today. I have a nephew who was, who is on the spectrum. And when he was born many, many years ago, and in fact, he is, I would say he is at least 30 years old. But when he was born, we were told that there was no hope for him, that he would be like a vegetable, that there is nothing that we can do. We could probably do him a great service by institutionalizing him. Um, I went to Johns Hopkins University and got some intervention. And today, Michael, my nephew, is self-sufficient in his own apartment. He has a job that he's been holding down now for at least 10 years. He's been promoted on the job. He is dependable. He will walk through a snowstorm to get to work. No matter what you hear about a person who is deemed to be on the spectrum, understand that they can have qual a quality life if we would give them the opportunity. Dr. Lucine Garapetian is proficient in providing such opportunities. So today, without any further ado, I give you the most gracious, uh, professional, and uh, heart 
loving, caring individual that I am delighted to have on our faculty, Dr. Lucine Garapetian. Please give her a warm GSEP welcome. Dr. Garapetian. Wow, thank you so much, Dean Williams. Um, I have so many thoughts about your introduction. I appreciate you sharing that very heartfelt story. I got a little teary eyed as you were telling that story because the journey that you describe is so common to so many of the individuals that we encounter in our lives. And I'm so happy to hear that your nephew has um, had a successful experience um, through life and has gotten to the point where he is living independently and he is self-sufficient and he is making decisions for himself and living his best life. Uh, thank you also for that wonderful introduction of me. Wow, I hope I can live up to these expectations that you've set for me, for our audience. And also thank you for your prayer and for the opportunity and the space for us to share these ideas with one another and to learn and grow with one another. So with that being said, I would like to introduce everyone to the title of my talk. This um, I will be presenting on autism acceptance, moving beyond awareness and toward allyship. Uh, before I get started, my pronouns are she and her, and I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which I sit, and for me that is Venice, California, which is the land of the Chumash tribe. So how many of you guys recognize these characters um, in these movies and TV shows? Uh, with Bruce Willis over here, we've got Mercury Rising. The child is uh, autistic and he is mostly non-speaking, but he is shown to have savant tendencies. Um, in the atypical TV show, the main character, Sam, is shown to have autism and he struggles with social skills and fitting in, similar to the struggles of what other teenagers might face. Um, up here we have Sean from The Good Doctor, who is a brilliant surgeon, but also has his quirks and is on the autism spectrum. Uh, down here we've got Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory. He's a scientific genius with ASD tendencies, and his rigidities are displayed as being cute and endearing. And finally, we've got that 90s movie, The Rain Man, where we see another example of an adult with significant social and communication skill deficits, uh, but with significant savant-like skills. So these portrayals don't show us how individuals with autism spectrum disorder may struggle to find or keep a job. They don't show us the self-simulatory behavior, the self-injurious behavior, the dangerous behavior that often accompanies uh, characterizations of ASD. They don't show us the difficulties families face with procuring services, with uh, making sure that their uh, loved one has the necessary accommodations uh, to become successful in the environments in which they're in. They don't show us the complexity in the experiences of autistic individuals over the course of their lifetimes. They provide a glamorized view of autism, right? Um, and they show it to us as, oh, look, there are some quirky tendencies with these savant um, behaviors that set them apart from everybody else, right? Um, and hopefully this is something that will change with um, increasing understanding, awareness, and acceptance of autism as we move forward. So now I wanna ask you, what do you think of when you hear autism? Is this what you see? Do you see tantrums? Do you see self-stimulatory behaviors? Do you see isolation? Do you see rigid behaviors? Do you see self-injurious behaviors? Do you see a bunch of happy kids hanging out and playing with one another? Can you tell from just these pictures alone whether someone has autism? And there is a correct answer to that question and that answer is no. There is no way to tell from somebody's physical features whether they have autism because autism affects every individual very differently and to varying degrees. Autism is classified in the DSM as a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, and it is not known to have any single cause. So as we get started with our presentation today, I want to start off by telling you about what is necessary for a diagnosis of autism. Well, first of all, the diagnosis of autism is made around two and a half to three years of age because it is diagnosed based off of behavioral characteristics 
And um, it's not like you can do a blood test or a genetic test and say, oh yeah, there's that marker, you have autism, right? Autism is diagnosed behaviorally and therefore the diagnosis isn't given until about two and a half to three years of age when we're seeing some more consistent performance from an individual. Um, and when we're seeing these deficits really come through. So um, in the first category, a diagnosis of ASD is given if there are persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction, as evidenced by deficits in social emotional reciprocity. Examples of this might include a uh, lack of normal back and forth conversation, reduced sharing of interests, uh, lack of emo uh, uh, reduced sharing of interests, emotions, or affect, a failure to initiate or respond to social interactions. Uh, we may also observe deficits in nonverbal communication, such as uh, poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication, abnormalities in eye contact or body language, deficits in understanding and using gestures, and a total lack of facial expressions and nonverbal communication. There are also deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. Um, here we might see examples ranging from difficulties to adjusting one's behavior to suit various social contexts or responding to social cues, um, difficulties in sharing imaginative play, difficulties with making friends, and an absence of an interest in peers. A diagnosis also requires there to be present restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities as evidenced by at least two of the following. Um, and these, uh, these characteristics must be present either currently or historically. Um, these include stereotyped or repetitive movement, motor movements, use of objects or speech, uh, such as lining up toys or engaging in echolalia, an insistence on sameness, inflexibility um, with adhering to routines and ritualized patterns of verbal or nonverbal behavior. So in this area, individuals might have a very difficult time with transitions. Um, they may display extreme distress at very small changes. Uh, they may need to take the same route to work every day or to school every day. They may need to eat the same type of food and have rigidities with these preferences. Um, these individuals may also display highly restricted or fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus. There may be a strong preoccupation with unusual objects. I had a client who was fascinated with elevators. His favorite thing to do was to watch YouTube videos of elevators going up and down. Um, and it also includes hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interests in sensory aspects of the environment. So hypersensitivity would be being excessively sensitive to noise, lighting, uh, textures. Hyposensitivity would be a lack of sensitivity to things like pain, temperature, um, and beyond. Um, and again, this is a spectrum disorder, which means that there is no one presentation for any individual. So a person could have a few of these or a lot of these, they could be minimally impacted or severely impacted. And it really is a spectrum. Um, no two individuals with autism are alike. In addition to those two main categories that I described, these symptoms must also be present in, early, in the early developmental period. The symptoms must cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. And these disturbances are not better explained by intellectual developmental disorder or global developmental delay. Now, it is important to note that um, intellectual disability and ASD often co-occur, but for a comorbid diagnosis to be given, the social communication, communication piece should be uh, below the that which is expected for the general developmental level for both diagnoses to be given. Um, all right, so the next important piece of the diagnosis is the level of support, right? Um, in layman's terms, we often talk about a person as being high functioning or low functioning. 
And we'll talk about that later in our presentation today about how those are not really terms that are conducive to an acceptance approach. Um, and according to the diagnosis, the diagnosis offers these three levels from level one to level three from requiring support, uh, requiring support which is uh, that without these supports in place, uh, an individual's deficits may cause noticeable impairments in a person's communication, socialization, and independence. To level two, which is requiring substantial support. Here, there are more noticeable differences in social communication. There may be limited responsiveness or the use of very simple sentences. There may be restricted or repetitive behaviors that are clearly interfering with that individual's functioning across a variety of contexts. And finally, we have level three, which is requiring very substantial support. And this level is marked by severe deficits. Um, it can include characteristics such as mutism or minimal responsiveness, and there could be restricted or repetitive behaviors that severely impact a person's day-to-day -day functioning. So moving from the diagnosis to talking about prevalence, um, the most recent CDC figures indicate that about one in 44 children has been identified with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and this might look to some folks as, wow, that seems really alarming, right? Why are the rates increasing so quickly? Well, it's important to put these prevalence rates into the context of uh, several features which may help account for that prevalence uh, and not necessarily be the reason, not necessarily have the reason for the prevalence increase be that we're seeing more and more autism presenting itself, right? Number one, there could be an increase, or there is, not there could be, there is an increase in the awareness by the public um, and by physicians and psychologists who make the diagnosis. We've refined our criteria in moving across all the different um, editions of the DSM. We have made this uh, from an autistic disorder to an autistic spectrum disorder. So now this diagnosis includes a variety of things that might previously have been categorized as something else, for example, such as pervasive developmental disability. Um, we have refined our ways of finding cases, right? And we have increased access to service availability um, and to education within the general public for what should be happening within childhood, right? So whereas before, if a child wasn't developing appropriate to uh, the milestones they were supposed to be hitting, we might have called them a late bloomer. And now we look at those cases and we have scales and screening tools that help us to identify this might be someone who needs additional support to be most successful throughout their life. Um, so take this data on prevalence with some caution. Um, I know it, it seems like there's a massive increase happening, but there could be these explanations that help to mitigate the increase that we're seeing. We're also seeing an increase in access to services and access to diagnoses across multicultural communities that have historically been marginalized. And that brings us to the next slide, which is disparities in diagnosis. ASD is reported to occur in all races, all or all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups in the United States. These differences persist even when parental income and education are controlled for. So what this suggests is that there are no cultural boundaries, there are no racial boundaries for autism. Um, what is likely going on is that ASD is underdiagnosed in individuals of colors, in individuals of color due to potential differences in illness beliefs, in access to healthcare, and in the procurement and use of services that might be available to someone. And hopefully with increased education, we can help to mitigate some of those factors. Another important thing to consider is that the majority of ASD research has been conducted on Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic countries. So we still need more research on what the variations are in rates between and within other countries, um, what different cultural norms uh, mean for different behavioral presentations in different countries, and if the diagnostic criteria might be slightly altered in different communities uh, than they are um, in a westernized, uh, from the Western perspective of what is considered acceptable behavior versus inappropriate or socially different behavior. 
So what's the etiology of autism, right? Autism is a behaviorally defined lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder with strong uh, evidence for a complex genetic predisposition. Um, currently, it is considered a neurologic disorder that is influenced by both environment and genetic factors. Um, autism does not result from differences with one location in the brain, but from differences with one or multiple neural systems and with underconnectivity of various cortical systems. So this is what the research shows us to date, right? Um, it shows us that we don't have a single known cause. We don't have a single genetic marker. We don't have a single environmental toxin that we can point to and say, this is what causes autism. In reality, the presentation of autism is the result of a complex combination and interaction of one's genetics, their environment, and chance variations in the uh, development of a fetus. Uh, so we want to keep this in mind as we don't, like, like when autism was first identified as a disorder, uh, there was this whole idea of refrigerator mothers, that the mothers weren't caring enough and that's why their children had these uh, signs and symptoms. But we now know that that's not the case. There is not something one can do to change whether or not a person is going to have autism. Um, and it is this complex interaction of a variety of variables. So rather than looking at it as this is a disorder that we must fix and that we must cure, we need to look at this as this is just a variation in the presentation of the human genome. Right. This is how uh, how we have variation within our communities. I mean, there might be a lot of genetic variations between who we consider to be neurotypical people, but we don't go around and say, oh, yeah, it's that gene that I need to tweak for you to be different. There's things that we want to all change about ourselves, but we don't go around saying this thing that I want to change myself is to make myself go from being abnormal to being normal, right? The thing that we have to understand and come to accept about autism is that it just is right? Uh, we are not trying to change or, uh, or fix someone. Who a person with autism is, who an autistic individual is, is okay um, in and of itself. And they are allowed to and capable of thriving and being successful, given the correct environmental supports. Now I'm getting ahead and jumping on my soapbox. So let's get there in a little bit. Um, so what are the, or what is the main evidence-based treatment for ASD? Well, the National Autism Center out of the May Institute generated a report called the National Standards Report to identify effective evidence-based practices for the treatment of autism. And they, uh, they came out with this report in 2009 and revised it in 2015 by conducting an additional lit review. Um, they generated one of the most comprehensive reviews of autism treatment literature ever conducted. And their review analyzed 775 autism treatment studies published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, they classified these as establishing, emerging, unestablished, and ineffective or harmful therapies. They found that a variety of applied behavior analytic treatment strategies and components were established as effective treatments for autism, including comprehensive early intensive behavior intervention. So now I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about what ABA-based treatments are, um, in case you are not familiar with this field, because uh, I know we're kind of a small field out here. Uh, so research has established applied behavior analytic interventions as the only treatment scientifically proven to provide these optimal outcomes in children with autism. Um, these treatments are endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Academy of Scientists of Sciences, the Surgeon General of the United States and the New York Department of Health. Um, common areas that ABA-based treatments are aimed at supporting individuals include acquisition of language or communication skills, whether that be vocal language or a picture communication system or a gestural communication system like sign language, um, targeting socialization, uh, play skills, uh, initiating interactions, uh, staying on topic, things like that, uh, recognizing social cues, uh, motor skills, so um, anything from fine motor to gross motor skills to oral motor skills, daily living skills, so things like hygiene, getting dressed, uh, cooking for yourself, uh, doing your laundry, uh, anything that is required for a person to live independently would be considered daily living skills, 
play skills. Play skills are so important for a lot of uh, things that we do as adults, right? So we have uh, representational play, we have imaginative play, we have pretend play, and all of these things allow us to uh, practice these experiences that we're ultimately one day going to have as adults. Um, and it also helps our socialization skills with other people. It teaches us to cooperate with others. Executive functioning skills, planning, organization, memory, uh, how do we work on those things? Um, social cognition skills, taking the perspective of others, uh, engaging in empathetic responses or remarks. Um, those would be social cognition. And academics in general, you know, uh, there's a huge area of ABA based treatments aimed at educational outcomes. The common behavioral interventions that get applied, and I mean, there's a very long list, but generally the procedures fall into one of these categories. We have discrete trial training, which takes complex uh, behaviors and breaks them down into smaller steps and then practices each one of those smaller steps to mastery so that uh, we can fill in the gaps in the person's knowledge when it comes to applying a skill in the natural environment. That brings us to natural environment teaching or incidental teaching, where we use what's available in the natural environment. We incorporate a child's uh, preferences. Uh, we, we follow their lead to some extent in terms of what, uh, what are the things they're gravitating towards and how can I use that, those things to create learning opportunities for the person? And how can I teach them in this controlled but naturalistic way? And then we have functional communication training, which is aimed at giving people the skills to use um, any form of communication to access their needs in a way that would be deemed, uh, that would allow them to access their wants and needs from the community. So um, what is the way that you can express yourself to other people and have other people honor what it is that you need from that moment? Now, throughout these treatments, the most important thing is that all of these treatments must be individualized. Just like no two individuals are the same, no two treatments can be the same. You could be working on the same goal, but that goal looks different in how you implement it from one person to the next. And for you to be able to individualize your programs, you must collaborate, right? Uh, so we have to get input from the family, from the teachers, from the aides, from the nannies, from whoever is involved in this person's life that can help offer a perspective and help us to get to know the person better, to understand their values better, and to be able to incorporate important cultural factors that are going to help make this skill that we're teaching applicable in the world in which this person resides. The key variables for effective ABA programs include intensity. So early intensive behavior intervention is uh, recommended to be offered at 30 or more hours per week of intervention for a minimum of two years. And this intensity is recommended uh, if like someone is not going to preschool or already getting other educational services, right? Like if they're only getting ABA based services, then they should get this healthy dosage of hours because the idea, and it's, it's not like you're sitting at a desk working for those 30 hours, right? The ABA therapy is happening over the context and course of the daily occurring routines of that person. Um, and that day is being structured in a way to create, to maximize on the learning opportunities for that person in a way where the child is uh, learning to be successful for those different opportunities. That's why this intensity component is here. Next, uh, these uh, programs have to have a basis in behavioral principles. So uh, that means that someone has to have a solid foundation of why does behavior work the way it does for them to be able to design these programs. And the reason that behavioral principles are so important is because behaviors are fluid, they're transient and they change, right? Their functions can change. So as the behavior is changing, you need someone skilled enough in this topic to understand that change and to be able to plan and accommodate for that change within the treatment program. Um, and that brings us to effective supervision. Uh, these services should be provided by individuals with extensive training in the field of ABA and with experience applying the principles across many different types of children, many situations, and many different behaviors. And finally, I hope I've emphasized this well enough at this point, individualization really is the key. Um, every program must uh, be tailored to each child's individual's needs across all areas of learning. 
So that's all the great, wonderful things that ABA does and what we need for it to be successful. Uh, but as we are evolving, as do every other, or as does every other field in the world, we have to take into consideration what is it that we could be doing better. Uh, where where are some of our limitations and what's potentially holding us back from helping people the way that we want to help people? I mean, nobody gets in this business because they don't want to help people, right? This is the business you come into when you decide, I am here because I want to make a difference in other people's lives. So for us to make that difference, sometimes we need to take off our blinders um, that have taught us very specific ways of behaving and look at what is the overall effect that what we're doing is having, and are we having the intended effect that we want it to have, right? So some things we need to consider in this area are social validity of our goals. Are the targets that we are selecting, are the goals that we're selecting, what our clients want, what, our, what the individuals with autism, what the autistic individuals want, or is this something that the parent wants or the teacher wants? Is this something that I'm doing because my curriculum tells me this is the next thing that I'm supposed to teach, right? How am I making goals on selecting? How am I making decisions about selecting goals for my participants? Um, acceptability of procedures is right along this line, right? Um, who are these procedures acceptable to? We know the behavior principles say extinction could be used to reduce behavior, uh, reinforcement is used to increase behavior, but is extinction the only way for me to reduce the behavior? Could I use alternative strategies if I find that this procedure is not acceptable to my family or to my uh, client or to my, to my autistic individual that I'm working with, right? Um, do my clients run away from me when I show up to session and want to work with them? Or do they approach me and are they excited to see me and are they looking forward to working with me, right? That can give you some insight as to the acceptability of the procedures that you're using. In behavior analysis, one of the things that we are always touting is that the learner is always right. And the reason for this is because they're coming from a place of deficit. If you don't know how to do something and I know how to do that thing, I can't blame you for not doing it, right? It's my job to teach you. It's my job to find a way to teach you how to do that thing. So we ascribe to this philosophy of the learner is always right. But in practice, is that really what we're doing? Because in practice, sometimes we have the approach of the behavior analyst knows best. Oh, I did this with another client and this is the protocol that we have to use to teach the skill, right? Are we staying true to our foundations of doing things the way that we know is best for our learners? And is that going to impact our therapeutic relationship and the acceptability of our procedures and our selection of goals? Everything has this domino effect on one another, right? So this brings us to client assent. Are we just telling the client what to do and forcing them to do things? Or are we making sure that they are in agreement with the procedures we're going to use. Now, oftentimes our clients can't verbally express themselves. We can't get informed consent, but we can get implicit consent, right? We can see if they are engaging in approach behaviors. We can see their affect. Are they smiling? Are they looking forward to what's to come? Or are they trying to escape from what's to come, right? Um, and ultimately this brings us to the crux of the issue which is, are the programs that we are running rooted in ableism? And I'm going to tell you what ableism is over the rest, course of the next few slides. So before I define it, I want to share this quote from a recent training that I attended that was conducted by a group of autistic BCBAs. The quote says, being autistic can feel like you're singing beautifully, but everyone keeps saying you're off key. So you're constantly trying to sing in key to sound like them, but it's painful because it's not beautiful anymore. Imagine forcing yourself to do this for decades, not only because you're terrified of sounding bad, but because you forgot the sound of your own voice, right? Um, I think this quote very beautifully highlights what it means to be different in a society that's getting you to be the same. And so the definition of ableism is it is a system of oppression that is pervasive, persistent, and prolonged discrimination and prejudice against people with disabilities. It prioritizes able bodies and minds over disabled bodies and minds. Similar to other isms, 
ableism manifests itself through long-standing institutions and subtle discrimination. I have this uh, cute little meme that says, imagine a bunch of apples met an orange, but instead of just saying it's an orange, they called it apple deficiency syndrome. That's kind of what it feels like to be an autistic. So ableism is perpetuated in our culture. Uh, it is embodied by our norms and our values, and it uh, is what identifies the representation of disabled people uh, and disability in the media that we consume. And at its heart, ableism is rooted in the assumption that disabled people require fixing and that they have to be defined by their disability. Um, this ableist perspective oftentimes arises from our medical model of disability. The medical model views a disability as a problem that exists in a person's body. Um, and then that individual requires treatments to fix that disability, to approximate normal functioning, or at the very least, to help that individual to adapt and learn despite the disability. On the other hand, we have the social model, which is what we want to be advocating for. The social model makes a distinction between impairment and disability. Um, impairment under the social model is understood as a state of the body that is non-standard. And that impairment may or may not be met with a negative evaluation by its possessor. So for example, if you have a person who was born blind, that person is not going through the world thinking that they're missing something. Their entire lifetime has been made up of being blind, right? So uh, we want to break this barrier of what's normal versus not normal because it really is a very individualistic uh, characteristic of what a definition of normal might be. Um, to the blind person, being blind is just a neutral way of being. It's not a deficit or a problem. That's all that they've ever known. Now, one of the issues with this medical model is that we need to talk about medical necessity to obtain funding uh, from our uh, funding sources so that we can help individuals. And this medical mo model assumes that disability is wrong and we're trying to quote unquote correct what this disability is. But what is disabling to individuals is not the person themselves, it's not the disability itself, rather it's the environments in which they're in, right? Um, so it's our responsibility to work to create inclusive environments through our words and actions so that people with different abilities become empowered. So here are some common ableist perspectives from a talk that I attended at a recent conference. A person with autism, right? So at first glance, you might be like, what's wrong with that statement? It sounds perfectly fine. Well, this is using person first language, right? And this idea, again, comes from the medical man model where um, to give a medical um, analogy, like you would never call someone a cancerous person, right? You would talk about them as a person with cancer, like this is the person, this is the disease they have. This is the same approach that has been applied to uh, developmental disabilities and autism, right? So we're saying this is a person with autism because were we to say an autistic person, that means that we are calling this person diseased in some way, right? It has the connotation that autism is a bad thing to have and by having it, uh, we are lessening the person. So by using this person first language, we avoid that perspective, right? Um, we also have, autism as an epidemic. Again, this is terrible in our world. Why do we have so much autism happening, right? Um, it creates the understanding, the implicit bias of autism is bad and we need to eradicate it. Autism as a tragedy. Oh no, you have been affected by autism. Um, suffering from autism, right? These are all very negative connotations of what it means to have autism. Uh, family who receives a diagnosis of a child with a, a, a diagnosis of autism for their child might be devastated by this news, right? And just like Dean Williams was describing earlier, uh, she was told about her nephew that they should just institutionalize him and give up and look at where her nephew is now working and being independent, right? So these connotations, these uh, overly negative approaches uh, shape the way that our society sees these diagnoses. Autism as a puzzle to be solved, curing autism. We're trying to fix something uh, because it's not right the way that it is. 
calling someone special needs. Special needs implies something extra is needed. Um, we are othering them. We're saying that this is normal and then you need something more. High versus low functioning designations. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit again in the next coming slides, uh, but uh, you're saying that if a person is low functioning, they could never develop the skills to do anything more than that. Um, and it, uh, it puts people in these boxes that that uh, shape the way that people see them, right? It's a label that prevents growth. Um, and it also does, doesn't recognize the unique skill sets of the person who may be low functioning or the special needs that someone with high functioning designation might need, right? Uh, because we're saying you're either you all low functioning or you're all high functioning. But in reality, you're along a spectrum where you have some special uh, advantages and you have some deficits that need addressing. Describing behavior as problematic or maladaptive. This one, uh, especially with the word maladaptive, this is one of my pet peeves. I don't understand why we use that word. All behavior is adaptive. All behavior is the function of uh, the learned context or, or all behavior is learned according to the context in which it produced certain outcomes for a person. We may not consider it to be appropriate by our social norms and standards, but it is adaptive in that it is producing outcomes that are maintaining the occurrence of that behavior. Um, and then also talking about there being a typical person on the inside where the autism is masking who this person truly is, um, is another common ableist perspective. So this brings us to neurodiversity. The term neurodiversity was originally coined by Judy Singer in the late 1990s. Neurodiversity is a viewpoint that brain differences are normal variations rather than deficits. And neurodivergent people experience, interact with, and interpret the world in unique ways. So this neurodiversity movement arose out of the autistic advocacy movement in the 90s that began to advocate for autistic rights and societal acceptance for autism in response to the marginalization of autistic individuals. Um, and this viewpoint um, helps to reduce stigma around learning and thinking about people's differences, but it's also very personal, right? Two people on the spectrum can approach the can approach having autism in two very different ways. And the neurodiversity movement accepts that. It doesn't say that, hey, I, as someone who doesn't have autism, am going to define what your life should look like. It says that you are free to make that decision for uh, the different abilities that you have, and you can construct your own normal um, in the context of what you find appropriate for yourself. Um, and ultimately, if we're to get really scientific and go to like our biobehavioral model, we're looking at a selectionist perspective here, right? Behavior analysts are selectionists, and diversity is necessary for the survival of a species, for the survival of behaviors over the lifetime of an individual, and for cultural selection. So if we, if we are adopting or if we're using the selectionist perspective, then we need to advocate for this diversity. Um, I also have a quote here from Judy Singer from 2020. She said, neurodiversity is a state of, na of nature to be respected. It's an analytical tool for examining social issues and an argument for the conservation and facilitation of human diversity. Um, and one hashtag that you might see is just different, not less. So what can you and I do in this situation? Well, we have to commit ourselves to being allies. Um, what is allyship? Allyship is defined as when a person of privilege works in solidarity and partnership with a marginalized group of people to help take down the systems that challenge that group's basic rights, equal access, and ability to thrive in a society. And it's really important that when we consider being an ally, we don't just do it in a performative way, rather we do it in an effective way. So an effective ally doesn't just talk about change, they take action and initiative to lead the change they wanna see. On the other hand, we have performative allies. I would call these the hashtag posters on Instagram or Facebook. 
Uh, these are folks that are allies only in name. Their support of a marginalized group is often just when it's convenient for them or when they can actually, and that can ultimately be very harmful to that group because it's representing the idea that, oh, look, there's so much acceptance and everybody's talking about it. But when it comes down to the actual environmental changes that need to take place for these people, those roadblocks are still there and those barriers are still up, right? Performative behavior is not going to move us forward. We need effective behavior. Um, and that comes with changing how we talk about things, changing how we uh, do other things, uh, how we, the actions that we take towards those things. Um, and I'll, I'm going to list some minor ones um, and then move into the world of how the field of ABA can address this slightly differently. So our actions matter, right? Representation matters. Traditionally, the sign of autism has been the light bulb with the puzzle piece in it. This came from Autism Speaks, and it speaks to the medical model, which is deficit-based. Um, and the, the aim is to fund for a cure, right? Um, what the autistic community tells us they prefer is hashtag red instead. Uh, they chose the color red because it's the color of fire and heart versus grief, which is blue is, you know, melancholy and depressing. Um, so they use the hashtag red instead as a symbol of autism advocacy rather than um, autism uh, awareness and looking for fixing it. Symbols matter, right? The puzzle piece, uh, it has a meaning of a person is suffering from this puzzling condition. They're missing a piece. They need to be solved, right? Instead, the autistic community prefers to use the infinity symbol, which comes from the gold for autism. Uh, uh, sorry, it comes from the AU symbol, which is the symbol for gold in the periodic table. Um, and then the rainbow is added to the infinity symbol to signify that neurodiversity. Identity matters. Um, and here, I have both a person with autism and an autistic person as acceptable. But the thing is, you have to ask the person what they prefer. You can't just go ahead and assume, oh, I'm just going to call everyone an autistic person who has autism, or I'm going to refer to everyone in person first language, right? Um, you need to give the person the dignity to have them tell you how they want to, you to refer to them as. Labels matter. Drop this high-functioning, low-functioning stuff. Instead, describe different specific abilities and support needs. Every person has some things that they do better and other things that they do worse, and that's not limited to a disability. So we don't call ourselves low-functioning people, right? Uh, we are a complex organism with complex um, experiences and skills. I have a statement of rights here for the rights of individuals with ASD, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this list. Um, but just overall to say that an individual who is receiving any type of therapeutic service has rights and they deserve to get a therapeutic environment. They deserve to get the highest quality of care. They deserve to be treated by people who are competent. They deserve to have their voices heard in their treatment and to have their treatment goals be selected by their team or by uh, have input on their treatment goals rather than just have other people select these goals for them. They deserve to learn the skills that are going to allow them to be independent and successful in their lives. Um, Finally, I want to make some recommendations for how we can incorporate compassionate care into our practices. The most important thing is to just even understand what compassionate care is, right? You're not just compassionate because you want to help people. You're compassionate when you have empathy, and then you can turn that empathy into action by helping to alleviate the suffering that someone is feeling. To do that, it involves things like taking another person's perspective. If a parent is distressed, if a parent is frustrated or upset that their child isn't making the progress they wanna see, then you can listen to them. You can validate their experiences. You can help them reorient the goals that they think is gonna help their child achieve these, goal, these uh, overarching uh, targets for independence. Uh, you can help to uh, 
have the parent recognize the progress that their child child has made up until this point, right? Um, you don't just want to be empathetic and say, uh-huh, yeah, I hear you. You want to move beyond that and come up with an action plan, right? You want to validate um, and you want to do these things to build relationships. The more we incorporate compassion into our treatments, the stronger our therapeutic relationships become and the better the team is going to work to help support our individuals that we are there to help to thrive. Collaboration, right? I feel like a lot of these themes tie together. We are not operating in a vacuum as behavior analysts just because we happen to be the ones that have the master's or doctoral level designation. We are just one person with an area of expertise and we are entering a system that is complex we need to understand the cultural factors for that family. We need to understand individual factors, family-related factors, um, and we need to take all of those into consideration when we're designing our goals and procedures. And that brings us to social validity again, right? Um, ask clients what they want to be working on. See if the targets you have selected are ultimately going to help them to thrive. Are they just things that you're doing because of a curriculum or because it's in the best interest of this person? Obtain assent, right? Make sure your procedures are acceptable to the family and to the client that you're working with. So I have this quote that I, uh, that I wanna provide before I move into a short video. The quote says, and, and this is a quote that I got from, a, from that presentation that I attended with uh, autistic BCBAs. Um, the quote says, human beings do not live in the objective world alone, nor alone in the world of social activity as ordinarily understood, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language, which has become the medium of expression for their society. It is quite an illusion to imagine that one adjusts to the reality essentially without the use of language and that language is merely an incidental means of solving specific problems of communication or reflection. So um, as I close out my presentation today, I want to share this short four and a half minute video with you guys. Autism is a neurological developmental condition which means our brains develop differently, some parts faster and some parts slower. Autism affects every person differently. If you've met one person on the spectrum, you've met one person on the spectrum. It seems everything I do is either too much or not enough or both. Gifts in one area may come with serious challenges in another. Autism is not a linear scale. This is one of the biggest misconceptions. We are not more or less autistic, higher or lower functioning. We are autistic in different ways and each have different support needs. The ASD levels 1, 2 and 3 refer to the level of support a person needs, not their ability to function if this support is in place. My special interests mean that I see the world differently. My sensory sensitivities mean I feel the world differently. And the way I think and process information means I connect with the world differently. From a young age, society teaches us that difference is bad. And so for survival, we learn to hide our true selves. Masking, camouflaging, passing. When we appear normal on the outside, it's not because we have ceased to be autistic. It's because we no longer allow you to see it. Having some autistic traits does not make you a little bit autistic. Any more than being sad from time to time makes you a little bit clinically depressed. Equating the two invalidates my experience of trying my whole life to explain my difference to others and not being believed. Autistic people are not the same as each other. What binds us together is the shared experience of being the odd one out. We are every age, every gender, every culture, every profession. Knowing I'm autistic tells you only one thing, that I do not fit into a box. And therefore, all your assumptions must be challenged. I learn and grow just like everyone else. So while autism is a lifelong condition, something I was born with and something that will always be a part of me, I'm constantly finding new and better ways to manage life and the challenges it brings. I am more and more myself each day. Autism is not a disease or a psychological issue. 
Therefore, you can't cure it any more than you can cure being tall or having long arms. That said, autism commonly has co-occurring conditions which may require their own treatment. The message here though is that I am not a broken neurotypical person, I am autistic. It's how my brain is wired, it's weaved through every aspect of my personality and it makes me who I am. Some everyday tasks are difficult or even impossible for me, but there are so many things that I can do that you can't do. So why am I the one with the disability? The answer is simple, because there's more of you and only one of me. Of course I want friends, just not on your terms. Not if it means I'm not allowed to be myself and I can't do the things I like to do. I want friends who will let me be me and love me for it. Being different is not always easy. I get bullied, I get picked last, I get left out, I get asked to leave groups because I'm not a good fit. I can't be like everyone else, even if I wanted to. And it's easy to get very angry at an unfair world. But you can make a big difference. You can talk to me, interact with me, let me join in, or let me sit on the sidelines without joining in. Invite me without the pressure to say yes. Don't expect me to be normal. Just let me be me and don't ask me to leave. To make the world a better place for autistic people, don't force me to fit in. Include me while I'm different. I hope you've enjoyed this video and please share this message as part of Autism Acceptance Month. I think that's a nice summary of hopefully what I was trying to communicate with you guys. Uh, let us give our speaker, Dr. Lucine Gerapetian, a warm GSEP thank you. Come, let us, please. Yes, it was fantastic, fantastic. And please put your comments and your uh, questions in the chat room uh, because we have a little time that we want your voices to be heard. Speaking of voices, I was immediately struck by your statement. Imagine you forgot the sound of your voice. Mm, that it, it just, it hit me hard because that is something that can be said in many settings, right? Uh, to your point of persons with autism not being any more unusual than everyone else, but being themselves, to lose your voice. That's hard, right? And in society, we often do that to people. We take their voices. We take opportunities for them to express themselves and we marginalize them, sit, sitting them on the side and not giving them opportunity because we are uncomfortable, not because of them, but because we are uncomfortable with their difference. So, so that really hit hard. You forgot the sound of your own voice. Mm. You want to expound on that piece, please? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that our approach thus far has in some to some extent been, how do we get you to behave in a socially appropriate way, right? How do we get you to be normalized? How do we get you to your age match, developmentally matched peers? And in that process, we may be masking who someone wants to be, what their actual preferences are, what uh, they may have to, they may feel like, in certain situations, they have to hide pieces of themselves because it may not be accepted. They should not, like for that, for example, the client that I talked about who loved train, not trains, I had a client who liked trains, the elevator one, right? Yes. Maybe he shouldn't talk about elevators with people. Maybe he needs to hide that part of himself, right? So this idea of hiding and masking who you are for the sake of having other people approve of who you are, you know, um, that's problematic. That is not the direction that we should be going in. Mm -hmm. um, we should be picking targets. We should be picking goals that are aligned with highlighting one's diversity and with emphasizing um, the pieces of themselves that they want to show to the world. Yes, yes. 
Thank you for that. We have so many comments in the in the chat saying uh, how much your presentation was appreciated. There is a request uh, for resources for actual ABA strategies. What would you, how would you respond to that? Can you provide resources? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is an area that our field is exploring and we're having more and more research be published in this area. Uh, but the specific strategies aren't a change to the intervention strategy itself, but in the implementation of that strategy. So um, making sure that when we are individualizing the goal and the program that we write to teach that goal, we are doing it in such a way that is acceptable to the folks that we're working with. Mm -hmm. We don't just have one tool in our toolbox, right? We don't wanna approach everything with a hammer. Um, if we have other tools, we wanna be exploring those and we wanna be finding alternative methods that are more acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. I know that's not a concrete answer and it's not like a, a document that I can point you to that mm -hmm. says, these are the resources for compassionate <laughs> care, right? But the idea is that we need to change our approach um, in how we use our tools. Sounds really good. Uh, there is a request, a question in the chat, uh, Dr. Garapetian. I'm hearing more recently about late adult diagnosis of ASD and the lack of diagnosis for women. Would you be able to speak to these issues? Yeah. So a lot of folks are growing up and finding out now that we have more information and education readily available, they're like, hey, some of these things apply to me. This is exactly how I was as a kid. I had to learn to do things differently so I would fit in, you know, um, and in reviewing their historical records and their experiences, uh, they can get a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder based off of these historical variables. Um, that's where these adult diagnoses are coming in. Um, the diagnostic criteria for ASD does specify that uh, what I was talking about in my earlier slides have to be present in early childhood um, or at the level at which those skills are would first be seen. Uh, but a historical diagnosis can be given because a lot of times, 10, 20, 30 years ago, the diagnostic resources weren't there. There were no, um, uh, there were no resources, uh, uh, no services available. Mm -hmm. There were no practitioners that were even informed about what it was, much less would be able to diagnose it, you know? So, and there was just a less access to care. Um, with regard to a lack of diagnosis for women, um, I am not an expert in this area for diagnosis uh, because in applied behavior analysis, our focus is more on the treatment side of things rather than the diagnostic side of things. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I would speculate is that it would have to do with the fact that the expectations for girls are very different than the expectations for boys. Um, and we are looked at just very differently in childhood, right? So if a girl is quiet and shy and mm -hmm. not interacting a lot, it's not looked at as a problem the way that it is for a guy or, or for a boy, right? Um, and so that may be a factor that played into, like these gender norms may have played a factor mm -hmm. for the lack of diagnosis. Well done, well done. Thank you so much. Thank you for this most insightful presentation. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise and your time with us today and just opening our eyes and our hearts to see uh, autism from a different perspective. Thank you for being part of our Lifelong Learning Women's Forum. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay you in your own voice. Thank you, Dr. Garapetian. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our session. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.